Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love. And we're going to deal with the levels of faith, the things that we have as far as expectations that we have from God, the power that moves in our lives as a result of it all, and the crippling effects of what we suffer from that can diminish and weaken our faith, our resolve, and our expectations. All right. So I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter one, because I want to establish who Jesus is. This, when the Lord led me to this, I was almost at the point of shouting. It was so exciting to be reminded in such detail. And sometimes we have to remember the authority that, that lives in us, the authority we have access to. All right, which makes life much easier because we have power to cancel, to start, to birth, and to kill, to destroy things that would come against us, things that God wants to ignite within us. We have the ability to work with God or work against him. It's your choice and it's my choice. Listen to what this says starting at verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. For those of you who are devil worshipers, this is Pat's two cents. Even the devil, you hear? All this, that God is all this. God is the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He was there. He was always there. And the only reason Satan exists is because of God. It's not the other way around. That means God is the bottom line of everything, y'all. All All right. Verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I'm going to stop there because what we're dealing with is the power We're dealing with all that God is, the authority of Jesus Christ. When your faith begins to weaken, when your knees begin to buckle, and it feels like all hell is breaking loose, remember who's in control, y'all. It's not the devil. It's not your boss. It's not your spouse. It's not that annoying neighbor down the street. It's not that child, that disobedient child. It's not the, the, the thugs in the neighborhood. God is in control, no matter what. God is in control. And once you are convinced, see, that's the problem, being convinced of it, that's what strengthens your faith. Sometimes you have to, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you have got to read the word, hear the word. You hear what I'm saying? 
that will build up your faith. And you have to read it more than once. You can't say, oh, I read that scripture 10 years ago. No, baby. That's like saying, oh, I ate my breakfast 10 years ago. Really? Think about that one. All right. God's word is our nourishment. God's word is our strength, our power to draw from. God's word is our enabler. His word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway. He shines his light in the darkness and his word illumines our darkness. When you're at a dark place, you're depressed, you're down. Life is beating you down and beating you down and people are coming up against you and you don't know what to do about it. You hit God's word and say, Lord, talk to me. I'm hurting right now. Talk to me. I'm beside myself. I'm at my wit's end. Talk to me, Lord, please. Trust me, God will, if you have an ear to hear and you have the patience to wait on him to do so. So you sit that Bible in your lap and you ask God to lead you to scripture, talk to you, and he will talk to you. I guarantee. See, one thing I noticed about God, he responds to hunger. If in the natural now, I'm, I'm getting this hot off the press, in the natural, I can see the donut right now. In the natural, you could be hungry as can be, haven't eaten all day. But that food is not going to come and pour into your mouth. That food is not going to lift the fork and put the food in your mouth. You have got to do that on your own. But when it comes to God and you're hungry for him, what ends up happening is it pulls on his heartstrings. He feels your hunger. It stirs something up in him that makes him want to draw close to you. Why? Because he responds to hunger. And the reason so many of us never experience God is because our hunger level is low. We don't have much of an appetite. We'd rather get up, get in our car, drive to the pizza factory, or drive to the donut shop and buy ourselves some goodies and feed ourselves rather than wait on the Lord and ask him to come and feed us with his presence, feed us with his essence, feed us through his word, feed us his love, his joy, his peace, his stabilizing power. Feed us with all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We don't think to do that. We don't take as much effort to seek him to feed our souls as we do hitting that refrigerator four or five times a day. So we have to ask the Lord at times to build up, put fire up under our behinds and put more of a hunger in us. If we don't have it, admit it, Lord. I'm not as hungry for you as I used to be. I'm not as hungry for you as I should be. Give me more hunger. Build up my appetite. Make me yearn for you. Not just for the goodies. Because you know with God come benefits. You know with God comes benefits comes uh, blessings and goodies, all that. But do you want the goodies or do you want God? Like the people who followed Jesus. Many of them followed him for the fishes and the loaves. Many of them followed him for the miracles, for the power, but they didn't follow him. And that's why when he said what he said to the crowd, which is not the point right now, but the point is so many of them left. So many of them left. He was standing there mainly with the disciples. And he said, will you leave me too? Why? He challenged them and they didn't like it. You see, when we come to God, we must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Seek him with all your heart. Seek his 
face, seek his will, seek his heart, his heart throb, seek him. And everything else comes with him, y'all. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. But what are you seeking? I fall short myself. There are times I find myself seeking the goodies more than God. Everybody falls into that trap. But we have to realign ourselves. We have to recalibrate and get it right. Get back in sync with him, with his heart. All right. Let me not uh, blow your eardrums off. I don't mean to yell. <clears throat> I'm trying not to cry. All right. Let's go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter four. Let's paint a scenario. The devil's wagging his tail, calling all kind of little demons and imps to come and sabotage all the goodies that, that God has planned in your life. He's doing his job. That's all. All right. Just remember who's on top always. God. God will never lose a battle to the devil. But we can if we lose our confidence. Listen, we have to hold our confidence steadfast. We have to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We have to have a, 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 a stick to itiveness that nobody can peel our hands. Nobody can peel our grip off of God, no matter what, because he is our stay. He is our shield. He is our anchor. He is our buckler. So we can make it through life because we know in whom we believe. We know who we belong to. We know who is right there with us. God with us, Emmanuel. We know we're never alone and he will never forsake us. So I remind you, he will never forsake you. No matter how it feels, no matter how alone you feel, no matter how people don't get you and people don't understand you, you are never alone. God understands you better than you will ever understand yourself. Now, let's read. Mm, mm, mm. Starting at verse 1, Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. You don't want to come short of that one. You want to always enter into his rest. You want to live in his rest. Okay, number two. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. Let me repeat that. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed to en do enter into his rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they do enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Let me stop right there just for a second. See, number one, and this is for those of you seven-day Adventists who get caught up in the law. Not all of you, just some of you. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He is our sabbatical Savior, our Lord and Savior. We enter into his rest. That is what brings us peace. Not, not recognizing a particular day or a particular ordinance. No, it is entering into his rest because Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. All right, now, moving right along, I had to put that little aside in there. Now, listen to this. The reason we worship and, and enter into the Sabbath day is not out of legalism. 
It's strictly because there are promises and benefits associated with observing the day. But it's not legalism, y'all. It's not going to send us to heaven or hell. Observing the Sabbath brings blessings just like reading the book of Revelation promises blessings for those who hear, read, and keep those words that are written in the book of Revelations. So there are certain things that God has that are compartmentalized that have blessings attached to them. And the Sabbath is one of them. But not observing the Sabbath out of legalism. I do it out of respect. More than anything else, just out of honor. That was his first design. I'm going with it. I don't have to. I can because my worship should be seven days a week. So it's not one day above all others, but I just observe it out of respect. I observe it also as a business strategy, which means there are certain promises that will be fulfilled just by doing that alone. Because sometimes, see, when God sees you go the extra mile and he sees why you're doing it, he says, oh, that one's smart. I like that one. That one's using their nugget and they're doing it for me. See, you can do it for multiple reasons as long as God is the ultimate. All right, now, listen. So when you're going through this and you see what it talks about, how they, a lot of things didn't come as a result of belief. So you can, if you don't have faith, you cannot enter into his rest. Now let's go into one of the analogies that came to my mind while I was preparing for this. Picture yourself floating in a swimming pool or in the ocean, doesn't matter, at a lake. Are you at a lake? Wherever you want to be, you just create your little body of water in your mind and plant yourself there. Now, here you are floating on your back. You're breathing. There's nothing hindering your ability to breathe. Some of you may not know what it feels like to float because your fear of water or fear of drowning may have hindered you from exploring that avenue. And I'm telling you, it is beautiful experience to swim, to float in the water, to get all in the water. Oh, I love it. Now, let me share this with you as an example. One day, I was at my niece's in Altadena, swimming in a pool. Everybody was inside. The day was over. I'm under, under the stars, enjoying the night all by myself, had the whole swimming pool, the whole backyard to myself, loved it. And I crossed my arms behind my head and crossed my ankles and relaxed in the water. I mean, I was resting so peacefully as I floated in the pool. Do you know, Grandma Sita sat up there and fell asleep, just like Peter does all the time. I fell asleep, y'all. The only thing I wasn't doing was snoring. <laughs> what woke me up was a few things of water splashed in my face. And I was like, oh, oh my God, I'm in the pool. I forgot I was in the pool. I was starting to dream. That's how rested I was in the water. I love the water, y'all. I love it. <laughs> so what I want to share with you is when you can really relax, when you can lay back and let the Lord hold you, let the Lord keep you, let the Lord sustain you, your rest is so much more peaceful. That's one of the reasons why Jesus fell asleep at the bottom of the boat when all the waves and the wind was kicking up a storm and the, the, the disciples were at their wit's end trying to figure out how not to drown because they knew that storm was going to tear the boat apart. But look what Jesus was doing. Why was he sleeping? Because he knew his father, who art in heaven, would not allow harm to come to him. He trusted in his father's keeping power. He knew he had the authority over the wind, over the waves, over the storm. And all he had to do was say, peace, be still. And whoosh, storm is over. Party's over, baby. Everything's perfectly still. 
So when I talk to you about going through life and you've got a storm brewing over your head, you got clouds forming, you got lightning striking, you got people looking at you crazy, talking to you crazy, treating you with disrespect, everything coming at you at all four corners of the universe. And you're at your wits end. Remember to call out to God and say, Lord, bring me peace. Bring me peace right now. Take out the hurt. Take out the anxiety. Take out my anger. Take out all my normal little sinful reactions and calm me down right now. Take it all out and calm me down. Fill me with your love. Fill me with your peace. Fill me with your joy. Do you know that can happen in a matter of seconds? You start getting in the habit of doing that every time somebody's tail, somebody starts to show their little narrow behind at you, you will find yourself accessing God's peace at every given moment, at every turn. That's right. It'll blow your mind that you don't have to go through the day all up in arms. It'll blow your mind that you don't have to be a nervous wreck no matter what's going wrong, it'll blow your mind that while somebody else is losing their cool, you're sitting there feeling nothing but still waters in your spirit. Why? Because you're leaning on God. You're resting in Him. You have entered in to His rest. And you can sleep at the bottom of the boat while all hell is breaking loose around you on your job. Amen? All right, now let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. And I want to share this and then I'm closing. Listen to this. A lot of times we don't realize that there are three or four things. I'm, I'm condensing for the sake of time because this could be an encyclopedia of all the things that go against your faith. Your fears, the things that you fear that could go wrong. What if this happens? What if I do this or say that and they do this or do that to me? Consequences, fear of consequences, fear of somebody coming against you, being intimidated by people, fear of man. Huh. What if uh, God doesn't come through like I need him to come through? Really? Wow. That's a faith killer right there. And I'm going to share some of the reasons that your faith can become weak. You could be slack in reading his word. In other words, that Bible barely gets opened by you, whether online or right there in the book. You're not listening to it. You're not reading it. You're not ingesting it in any way. Number two, you've never experienced God. And one of the reasons for that can also be because of lack of hunger. Your appetite is, is wimpy when it comes to wanting the things of God. You'd rather watch a good movie than spend time with God. You'd rather go out with your buddies and have fun or go to sleep after a good meal than stay up reading his word trying to hear from him, asking him to speak in, prophesy in to your life. Yeah, sometimes we don't really care what he's got to say because we got our plans and we don't want him interrupting our plans. Many reasons, sometimes sin could be lying at the door. How many sins? All kinds of sins. Maybe you're dabbling in witchcraft, psychic, uh, hotlines, tarot card readings, crystals, uh, new age this, new age that, Scientology, whatever, or you're engaged in sexual promiscuity, or maybe you have chosen not to forgive somebody. Wow. Yeah, that can work against your faith. You know why? Not because you don't have faith in God. But you don't believe God's going to want to bless you knowing what you're harboring in your heart. Because you know. You know what you're harboring in there. And you know it goes diametrically opposed to the way God 
the way his love operates. Mm -hmm. His love operates in compassion, mercy, patience, long suffering, peace, kindness. Mm. <laughs> and you're nowhere near that because you're ticked off. Somebody rubbed you the wrong way. You don't even want to be around them. That's why some of y'all don't go to church. It's not because the saints are all that messed up. It's because you refuse to forgive. And then you have a hard time believing God's going to do this, that, or the other for you because you know, know you're standing out of, out of bounds. You know you have crossed the line and you're not positioning yourself to obligate God to fulfill his promises. Obligating God is by obeying them. He cannot contradict himself. Uh, the book, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, you read what he talks about blessings, the conditions for receiving blessings and the conditions, which are many more, for receiving cursings. You read that and compare yourself, look at it like a mirror and say, now, where do I line up and where do I fall short? And you pray on that bad boy real quick, repent and get back in sync, get back in line, recalibrate and get on the good foot mm -hmm. so you can stay in the blessing lane and receive those blessings through your obedience. All right. Now, so we're going to go through faith here. We're going to read the thing of faith. I want you to go here with me. All right. And I'm only going to read a few starting from verse to, to um, blah, 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 verse 1 to 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Oh, I want that testimony so bad. Six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There's their seeking again. Seeking him, not the goodies. He's not your Santa Claus. He's not your bellhop. He's not your sugar daddy or your sugar mama. He is not even welfare. He is your Lord and Savior, your Father which art in heaven that is pulling for you, that is working things out on your behalf, that's protecting you from danger, seen and unseen, that is delivering you, freeing you, cleansing you, washing your spirit, healing the inner man, healing your body, healing your psyche. He heals, baby, in every way, shape, and form. All right, now listen to this. <laughs> Seven, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of the things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into the place which he should go after receive, which he should after receive an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in the strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and heirs with him of the same promise. 10, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. 11, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, I'm going to stop right there. There are things in your life that God has lined up for you 
And some of you will not embark on them. You will not step into, you won't even get your ankles wet because you're always afraid that he's not going to come through. If you don't know him, you don't really know the goodness of God. If you don't know the goodness of God, you cannot be convinced. And because you cannot be convinced, you're clouded with doubt. Doubt sabotages faith, y'all. You hear me? Now, one of the things that a lot of us fall short in, this is a common practice, y'all. Dangerous, but common. Oh, too common. Is that we will not put our faith to the test when it comes to being tempted. When it comes to fighting those attitudes, those fleshly attitudes of resentment and anger, bitterness, wrath, strife, resent, uh, I already said resentment, anger, uh, frustration, um, suspicions, all of that. And all that I didn't even answer. But listen, y'all, when you know that you're leveling in that area, you got to really pray against that because that's when you must engage your will. When you engage your will and you say, do or die, I'm going to trust God no matter what, even if it doesn't turn out the way I want. Because one thing you will learn, obedience is brings blessings. It doesn't always bring an ideal laboratory condition, but it brings blessings. So when you act out in faith and something goes wrong while you're in the middle of carrying out that deed of faith, God's got your back. He's right there to rescue you. Why? Because you stepped out on faith. And see, believing is not just praying and saying, I believe God, I'm trusting in God, I'm waiting on the Lord. Believing is preparing for the blessing you're waiting on. I'll give you a quick example and then we're going to close because I don't want to be too long. Years ago, the Lord gave me a dream that I was driving down the street in an, a little old car. It was a little old car. And in the dream, I knew that this car was given to me. So I woke up, I told a couple of my friends, and then one of my friends who I had not mentioned it to called me and said, the Lord laid it on my heart to give you my old car because I just bought a new one. I said, oh my God, there's that dream come true just like that. See, I knew when God gives me a dream about a car, it's going to happen. So I dreamt, I trusted, I told it, I expected it, and boom, it happened. Because I really believed that God was going to do it. Now, here's the crazy part, y'all. This is where one of my friends got on my case and said, well, now you don't even have a car. What you going to do now? The reason for that statement was, one night, I had a dream that I woke up on a cloudy day, and I woke up in my town in my car. I won't say what kind of car. It was a car. It was a bigger car. I woke up in the car, and I looked around, and it was in pristine condition, and I said, oh, my God, God's going to give me back my car. I had to sell the old one because there was something wrong with the catalytic converter, which corrected itself over time. But there were other things that were starting to go wrong because I used that car to death, putting my husband in and out with the wheelchair and oh, anyway. So sure enough, uh, the Lord let me know it was time to sell that car. And then I was without a car for two years and the Lord let me have a dream that somebody gave me an old car and I had that car. Now, three months in, I had a dream that I wake up in, the, in this car. And when I woke up in this car, I knew exactly what kind it was. I knew there was an O in the license plate right in the middle. And I said, wow, it was the third or fourth, you know, thing, but I knew it was in there. So um, I woke up and I started telling folks what God was going to do. Well, 
I'm talking, and this is maybe almost a year or a year and a half down the road. I, I got the time span mixed up, but the bottom line is it happened. So I called my niece, and she's online trying to help me find that kind of car. We're looking, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking. She puts in an ad, you know, this is wanted, whatever. And she gets a hit. So somebody contacted her and somebody else contacted her. And it was about three or four, you know, they were out there. One was in Orange County where Peter lived. And I, I, the Lord laid it on my heart to ask him to test drive the car. So he test drove the car. He said the car was in pristine condition. I said, okay. I said, I got to get rid of my old car. So I'm sitting up here putting this car on the sale rack. And within a 24-hour period, the car is sold. Cash right there in hand. So what happens? I only sold it for like, five or six hundred dollars <laughs> but anyway but it, it helped me out a lot <laughs> yeah so the bottom line is now my garage i'm clearing out my garage making room because this other car is bigger so i'm getting rid of stuff getting rid of stuff getting rid of stuff i'm making room for the blessing an act of my will i'm acting out on my faith but i have no car as yet my old car is gone now and the car I'm waiting for is not there yet. And what does the Lord do? Within two weeks, I get a ride down, test drive the car, and then a blessed angel says, I didn't tell you, but I'm going to, uh, I I'm going to pay for the car. I knew in all the dreams that I didn't have to come out of pocket. I just didn't know how it was going to happen. So even though I didn't have the money, I still move forward and made preparation for the blessing I couldn't even afford. What are you willing to do by faith? I've got the car now. It still runs beautifully. What are you going to do by faith? What are you going to act out on in spite of all the things that speak against you? Well, what are you going to do now? Now you don't even have a car. You don't have the money. What are you going to do? Now you don't have any transportation. Within two weeks, I was set. I was good to go. Why? I acted out on my faith in God. Because God speaks to me in dreams. How does God speak to you? What are the many ways he communicates with you? And when he does, do you act on it or do you sit on it? Hmm? Yeah. What do you do with God's promises, y'all? I beg you, if your faith is weak, get in that word. Read all the ways that he fulfills his promises. Because God is love and love does not contradict itself. Trust in God's love for you. Trust that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Please trust. He's not a man that he should lie. And I feel like I need to close on that and leave you. Bam, I'm done. God bless you. I hope that encourages you to build up your faith. Amen.